Hello again, it's Lori White, President of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. I hope everybody is doing well on this Friday afternoon. Today is episode 127 of Chamber TV, and I can't think of a better guest today than to welcome our new Lieutenant Governor, Sabina Matos. Madam Governor, welcome. Such a pleasure Thank you. to chat with you today. Thank you so much, Laurie. It's my pleasure to be here with you and wanted to do this. We've been trying to connect for quite some time, but I'm so glad we were able to finally make this happen. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So the night that um, the night that you were selected for this role, um, I was so excited for you. And I know we've been texting in the intervening days uh, leading up to this uh, discussion. So. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time um, celebrating with you, if you will, and to ask you, um, you know, what what day is it today for your uh, it, a role in office? Is it day 20, 24? This is day 24, so we're getting there. <laughs> it's still uh, new in the role, it's still trying to get things settled in the office. Um, I was just saying, um, but today that normally when you get elected to the position, you get a, about six weeks in which you're able to plan your office, set up the office, get everything ready to start. When you get appointed, you don't have that time. You start working right away while you're trying to set up the office. So that's what we have been doing. Fantastic. So your official um, swearing in was a beautiful yes. ceremony last weekend on the steps of the state house so tell us a little bit about what you were thinking on that day yeah i have to say at the beginning uh, i i thought I, well do we really need to have a ceremony in and then governor mckee um insisted he says um we have to make this this is a, um, a special moment uh for you for your family and for the community and i, I, I thank him for insisted on us having that event because it turned out to be beautiful it was beautiful to be there with the families and friends families and friends and also it, we had a perfect weather uh, the front of the state house uh, which was the location that, that we chose it was just perfect and i could not ask for a better day i really enjoyed the whole uh ceremony and i was able to have friends and family here so it, it was just perfect when you were being sworn in, what were you saying to yourself? Um, that it really, it, this, this has really happened. Uh, since, since I was selected and the process going to, to the um, Senate for confirmation in after the confirmation and it was approved, um, I'm, I'm being thinking, oh my God, this really happened. And then uh, feeling the love, the, the support from from uh, friends and family. I have, I think, getting notes uh, from uh, individuals close and far away, uh, saying congratulations. Some of, some of the most beautiful message that I have ever gotten, I've been getting um, the, that comment on some right handwritten notes or text messages, social media posts. This has been very um, overwhelming in a good way. It, it has been, it has warmed my heart to get so much positive energy coming my way from so many uh, people, good people. I completely understand that. And that must be uh, an amazing feeling to, um, you know, to look out and to sort of pinch yourself and say, you know, wow, this is, this is real. And this is, this is really different. What, um, so you are not a stranger or um, a person who is new to elective office. You have a very substantial record um, on your own prior to this uh, as a leader of the Providence City Council and many roles there. So how do you see, you know, what are the similarities? What are, what are the differences in terms of the issues and the intensity of the process? Yes, so uh, I believe that being in the Providence City Council um, has helped me, has prepared me for uh, this role. Um, 
as, as you said, I was elected to the city council three times. I was first the president for 10 four for the city council, and most recently I was the president of the city council, uh, which is a position that is elected by my peers um, in, in the council. Uh, I, I had had experience in the city council working with different stakeholders uh, in the community, from businesses, from developers, uh, you name it. So I've been in, in, in that role, I was able to um, experience different uh, uh, government at, at different levels, working with my colleagues to get things accomplished, working with uh, uh, community members to make sure that their voice is part of the process and their voice is being heard, working from uh, leaders in, in the business community um, to advocate for the small businesses and for business of the business community in general. So I think that all that experience has been has prepared me for this role right now. I just get to do this at a at a bigger stage beyond the city of Providence. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And um, what are what are some of the issues, um, Governor, that you are interested in championing in your role as Lieutenant Governor? So I have been a big advocate for small business uh, since my role uh, at the city. And one of the, my, uh, the areas that I wanted always to do the most work is supporting uh, the small business to help them grow and, and, and increase their, their, their capacity um, because that translates into them hiring more people in, in, in our community. So the small business, supporting small business is gonna continue to be a big part of my uh, work here. It was a big part of Governor McKee when he had this role also. He worked a lot with the Small Business Coalition, um, making sure that the small businesses' voice was being heard at the government. So I'm planning on continuing uh, that work. I'm planning on um, working also the other areas that the office already works on, which is the um, long-term care is, I think, um, learning more and more about the role of the office in the long-term care. So that's another area in which I'm going to continue to work. The emergency management, I, today we just had a great meeting with the emergency management, management agency leadership, learning about the different um, divisions and the work that they do. And there is so much in there that we have to make sure that the information is getting to other elected officials, and that's getting also to the local elected officials so they know about the role that the agency plays in case of emergency um, in, within their communities. So those are the areas um, that the office already was doing work with. And I'm planning on championing from this office housing. I believe that for the longest time, I believe we need someone advocating for housing um, from the state house. Um, housing for the whole state of Rhode Island. Uh, one of my first uh, community involvement was as, as a board member for Oneville Housing, which is now is one neighborhood builder. And um, I remember my experience working on the board, learning about the process of how um, to build affordable housing in the community, but the difference that, that those affordable housing made in that community. Um, I can tell you for the only little neighborhood of what I, um, that I, I represented, the, the affordable housing that was built transformed the community. In, 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 that, in, in, in that has been key on the improvement that had happened in the area. But at the same time, we have to make sure that once that we're doing this, statewide that were included in all the cities and towns, all the 39 cities and towns, like Governor McKeel says that before my 100 days, we're gonna, the two of us are going to visit every single community of the 39 cities and towns. But we have to understand that um, once we need affordable housing everywhere, but two, that we also need market rate housing, we need what, what I call the workforce housing. Um, we need to uh, make sure that we're building housing for the teachers, for the firefighters, for the police officers. So we need to have a, a housing strategy that, uh, that is going to be a statewide and that is very inclusive that different styles of housing needs and also housing construction. 
what what are your thoughts of how to really begin to tackle this issue? Um, there were various housing bonds that were passed um, in previous general elections. So now, no doubt, building on some of the, the goodwill and the financial resources uh, that were extended through those through those bonds. Um, what other strategies um, have you identified that would help to really accelerate to an even greater extent um, putting shovels into the ground? So I have been approached by um, so it, individuals that have heard me speak about how they, my interest in housing has been reaching out to my office, and I've been having some um, preliminary meetings with with um, some of them. What I'm looking for forward to doing is a housing summit because I want to make sure that everyone's voices is part of the process of developing this housing agenda. And I want to make sure that in this housing summit, we get all the inputs on all the different strategies. I don't I, I don't want to come with a preset, okay, we're going to do uh, affordable housing here and there. I want to hear about the different um, strategies for a housing development that, that I have been having uh, conversations offline prior to my role here. I want to hear about how can we make sure that the housing that we're building is net zero. How many of those can we build right now? Like one neighborhood builders is has a great project of these small houses that are um, energy efficient, fully energy efficient. How can we do more of that? How can we do the micro uh, houses um, as a um, as a part of the of the of this uh, strategy? How can we make sure that we um, when we are redeveloping uh, a new, let's say, um, a mill building, and we are adding uh, apartments in there, I will make sure that we have affordable housing um, there mixed with the uh, market rate. So there are different um, voices that I want to bring to the table, but also the private developers, because government cannot do it alone. We cannot do all of the work that is needed to provide the housing that that the state needs and and the projected um uh the projection that we have if we want to grow the population so i want to make sure that we are also bringing in private developers as part of this conversation we are talking to lieutenant governor sabina matos and this is episode number 127 of chamber tv we are live on Facebook, we are live on Twitter, and we are live on YouTube, and we are open to your questions. So if you are listening and you have a question that you'd like us to pose to the Lieutenant Governor, uh, put it in the chat box and we will make sure that um, we are able to get your question answered. So, so far we've been talking about um, Providence City Council and your experience there as the leader of the Providence City Council, and we've been talking about um, your inauguration day. We've been talking about some of the issues that you are prioritizing in your office. So we have spoken about housing, uh, emergency management, long-term care, and um, other issues around the broad category of small business. So let's let's take a, a moment or two, if you don't mind, Governor, and peel back a little bit more about what you are hearing today from small businesses yeah. are looking to you to be um, a leader and a champion for the issues. So um, tell us a little bit about how those conversations are going. And um, I'm sure it, it, it matches to a, a great extent a lot of the conversations uh, that we are having with our membership as well. Yes. So the, the Small Business Coalition, we're still having the Facebook Live every other week. And um, I hear direct uh, questions from the small businesses. And also, I have been going with Governor McKee to visit some communities, some different um, cities and towns. Um, one of the things that keeps coming back is the lack of workforce. The workforce is the biggest challenge that I that we are hearing from the small business uh, community. They are there are like restaurants are ready to reopen, but they don't have enough staff in order to reopen. So that's one of the biggest challenges that that they have. Um, if it's 
when we went to Newport, uh, one of the things that we hear from the business in Newport is they are, their business is looking good. It's, they're getting enough reservation. It looks like they're gonna have a good spring, a good summer. Uh, the challenge for them is the lack of workforce, right? That's the biggest challenge. Now, if you take a look at uh, the businesses um, in Providence, downtown Providence, uh, pro we have a, this is a different problem there, is that uh, we need to make sure that there's going to be enough activities taking place that are going to be attracting um, uh, people to kind of uh, to visit us to come to to the downtown Providence area and to make sure that the businesses in this area can survive. So they are, the one theme that goes across, I think is the lack of, of enough workforce, is the one, the number one thing that we hear, but there are a particular um, different issues that are affecting different communities. Sure, um, I did, uh, I saw uh, pictures and video of you when you went to Newport and you were, uh, touring the area and you were visiting with our colleague Aaron Donovan Boyle from uh, the Newport County Chamber and visiting a lot of um, the the restaurants and the tourism destinations there and you know this whole topic of getting people to work is mm -hmm. is really a big one and it's yeah. not resonating just within the hospitality trades but we are hearing about it in lots of other industries in that um, the additional federal boost could potentially um, be to blame for that. So if you're at a certain income level that the the idea of like, well, maybe I won't necessarily go back to work right away. That is sort of, you know, creating a situation where there's dampening demand, if you will, and business is not going to be able to, you know, fully recover, fully reopen if they don't have the staff. So what are your thoughts about, um, you know, that whole discussion about unemployment and benefits? Well, I just think that it's not as simple as that the uh, individuals don't want to come to work because they're getting the, the, the incentive. I think it, it, that plays a role, but it's, that's not the only issue. If I'm a mother and in, in I don't have child care available, or my child care uh, that I have to pay is going to cost me almost the same amount that I'm going to be making for going to work. I will pick to stay home with my kid instead of going back to work. So this is more complex than that. It's not just simply because the benefits there, people don't want to work. I don't. I don't believe that that's uh, as simple um, like that. I, this is more complicated. But I do understand the challenges that that the businesses are facing because if they if they if they're not able to um, provide the same level of income that individual is getting while they're still still being at home is a problem. But I think is that there are tools that the business the business community can be utilizing uh, to help them in the meantime um, get through this this um, situation. Um, right now, I know that the director of DLT, Matt Weldon, is, has introduced our le legislation trying to address the challenge of the uh, incentive of coming from the federal government with a, a, a solution at a local level, at the state level. But in the meantime, the businesses also could be using the, um, the work share program. I think this is a good alternative that could help them um, maintain their, the workforce that has been trained already, make sure they don't lose those workers that they, they already know, know the job so they don't have to be training someone new. But at the same time, give them that, the, those workers the flexibility to be able to participate of the federal uh, program. When you bring up um, a good point around the, the work share program and for those that may not be familiar with it, it's uh, a program where you literally share jobs. So two people share a job and working with DLT and through DLT, there are certain supports that are extended to uh, the employer and the employee to make um, job sharing really work for both sides. Mm -hmm. um, 
So can you tell us a little bit more about what a business owner or some employees, a group of employees, um, what their next steps might be if they wanted to explore that in the meantime? Yes. So I think the best uh, would be to uh, reach out directly to the Department of, of Labor and Training or just go to their website at dlt.ri.gov uh, um, and go and find the information about the work share program in there. I, I, I believe, honestly, that this is a program that could be helping a lot of the businesses right now that it has been uh, underutilized. So this is a tool that you could be using now all the way to September in, in you should take advantage of that program. This could be a way to release some of the pressure that you're getting right now um, in your business um, in, in, in make sure, which is the, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're able to maintain your workers that are already trained so you don't have to start training a new workforce. So I, I think it's worth it. It's worth it to take a look at that problem. I saw the other day where Commerce Secretary uh, Gina Raimondo, with whom you met the other day, um, has also weighed in on this issue around the, you know, the challenges of getting workers back and, and the notion of childcare. Um, did you uh, did you have a great time the other day when you were with uh, the Vice President and with Secretary Raimondo? Um, what were some of the issues that you talked about? Give us some behind the scenes. Uh, so I, I participated at, at the end of the day. I was able to see the vice president in, in I'm going to be completely honest. I had my marching orders from my daughter. So my message to her was that my daughter wanted her to know that she was awesome. So that was, that was as much as I got to tell her. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I couldn't go back home without delivering that message. Uh, the vice president was very gracious, and uh, she was uh, asking me, even asking me what was my daughter's name, and she said, "Make sure you tell her, Marie, that I say thank you." So that was my marching order for the short period of time that I was able to be with her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that it looked like a very interesting roundtable uh, discussion. Um, led by the vice president and the governor and um, the secretary. The, the table discussion was great. I was able to see um, the the Facebook um, post um, in, in the in the the community conversation. I'm so glad that Dr. Fernandez was able to uh, present uh, uh, in, in talk about the work that he has been doing. I, I'm, I'm so glad that he had that opportunity because with everything that we went through this last year, uh, Dr. Fernandez played a key role uh, in different communities like in Central Falls and also in Providence, making sure first that testing was available and then after making sure that vaccines were available. So I'm glad that, that um, the vice president was able to hear directly from him. Um, also, there's other small businesses that, that presented and uh, uh, that were able to do uh, um, a presentation. Um, seeing this turning, um, doing a presentation about her business, uh, it, it just, it, it was uh, heartwarming to see that, that she had that opportunity to, to present also. So I'm, I'm so grateful that the secretary brought, uh, was able to be here and bring the uh, vice president to Rhode Island. You, uh, what do you think the significance of having Secretary Raimondo and um, Vice President Harris here in Rhode Island, what message do you think that sends to the rest of the country? I think it sends the message to the rest of the country that um, one is, I have to say, we have to, as a Rhode Islander, uh, have to be proud to see um, former Governor Raimondo, now Secretary Raimondo, uh, playing a, a, a such a key role of the Biden Harris administration as the Secretary of Commerce. Um, and to see her, her, her leadership and the leadership of her and the Vice President in, in talking about the things that are affecting us every day, our, our quality of life in, in our and the business community. Um, I, it was very uh, exciting to see that for me. 
And um, one of the things that I, I was very uh, thrilling is to see these two powerful female leaders uh, leading the conversation. It, it was really um, very gratifying. Now, you, given your experience in government and the like, um, were you able to share some advice that you had for them? For that, well, they were talking about the, the, small, the small business community. I think um, just rem reminding about the challenges that their business community is going through right now, uh, that even though right now we are um, not we're coming out of the pandemic here in Rhode Island, we're about 70% vaccination rate. Uh, we still have a lot of challenges. It's not, we're still gonna need the support. We're still gonna need them to continue to advocate for us and to um, support the business community. Uh, the business community is gonna continue to need help for quite some time. In, in, in the one thing I would tell them is just to continue to provide us uh, with support and resources so we can help our small business community. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the notion of three strong women being there on that day, talking about issues, talking about Rhode Island, talking about business, um, talking about social enterprise, greenhouse and the like. Um, tell us a little bit about what what you were thinking about the, the tableau, of you, if you will, of three strong female leaders at the very top of the government hierarchy, what that says um, to all, you know, young women, you mentioned your daughter and the like. Um, have you had a chance to to think about it through that lens? What I think is that is finally um, our society is tapping on all the resources that we have. Because if we, uh, if we were not, um, if we didn't have the leadership, the female leadership being part of the conversation and of driving the agenda and also being part of the decision making um, of power within the state, within this, the country, is half of our population has half of our resources that is not being utilized. So we are at a, at a stage right now in which we are recognizing that there are more voices that should be included that there are more opinions that should be part of the discussion. And, and I think we're gonna, this is, this is gonna be good, not just for the state, but for the nation, because we are tapping in the resources that we have that we were not utilizing. Mm -hmm. It was about time. <laughs> so I feel like it's about time that we're using all the resources that we have available. Yeah, well, I was interested to see that Governor McKee, uh, when you visited the bookstore, uh, purchased her book. So that looks kind of cool. And <laughs> yes, that was a good move. Yeah. That was a good move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, did uh, did you buy any books? And what did what did the governor? I, I was not at the bookstore, so I didn't get to to buy um, any books. Uh, but uh, the governor did pick the right book. <laughs> <laughs> What, did, uh, what were his thoughts at the end of the day? He, uh, he, you know, is in a similar position to you are saying, wow, what a, di you know, what a difference a day makes. Yes. So when we were talking actually then, uh, uh, yesterday, what we were doing the, the, the town hall um, about the 2030 plan for this day, um, we were talking about this and we talked about the book that he bought and he says, oh, I love her book. We were just laughing and saying that he made the right decision. Yeah, no, I, um, I listen to books through Audible, so I, you know, it inspired me. I'm going to download it and uh, listen to the vice president's book as well and uh, uh, learn and gain some new insights. But you bring up the 2030 plan, Governor. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about that. We only have a few minutes left, um, but I do want to, you know, it's a very important topic, the notion of the stimulus funds and how the state can best use the stimulus funds to make uh, investments that are not 
necessarily recurring investments or plugging the holes with the you know short term thinking, but really laying the groundwork for something bigger and grander and really making some transformational investments. And that that's the purpose of the the twenty thirty um, discussion. Is it? Am I correct? That is correct. Uh, we have to think about that. This is a one time. Um, investment opportunity that we have in what are we want to hear from Rhode Islanders, everyday Rhode Islanders, what is your opinion about what is the best way in which we can invest these uh, resources to make sure that in 2030, um, when we look back, um, what what is the future of Rhode Island that you want to see um, happening um, to, in 2030? Um, how these resources are going to be invested to create that future Rhode Island that you would like to see. So we want to make sure, the governor wants to make sure that we hear from our Rhode Islanders. What he's saying is, um, I don't have a committee. The Rhode, Rhode Islanders are the committee. So this is an opportunity for everyone to have a say on how we plan and um, how we're going to be investing these resources. The, um, the investment and the utilization of those resources. So are we thinking that it's um, monies that will not be deployed necessarily at the end of this budget year, this fiscal year of June 30? We don't, we don't know yet um, when it's going to be out uh, there. We're still in the process of getting the uh, instructions from the Office of Budget of the federal government. Um, I, we're expecting that we're gonna get guidelines, maybe, um, maybe by the end of, of, of this, this or just Friday. Maybe, but we we're expecting maybe by the end of this week. So maybe we get some um, guidelines um, from the federal government about how the money can be used. Uh, if not, hopefully early next week. So we're still waiting for the instruction for the federal government on how the money can be used. In the meantime, we're trying to get the feedback from. Um, of individuals in the state about what are the areas that uh, they think this funding should be um, go to. Have, uh, did you hear anything um, the other day? And I know this is part of a series of um, forums that you will be having and um, some other organizations, right back in Rhode Island Foundation and others, other groups um, are also you know thinking the same question it's a really important question and it's um it's really important that everybody is really you know thinking it through and having you know the right perspective on it um but did you hear anything that was new or surprising or different or how is the administration going to you know begin to sort through some of these these priorities I was pleased to hear uh, some of the topics that have, are part of my priority um, here in the office. The housing kept uh, coming up during the, uh, the last discussion. And actually, the next one is going to be about housing. I believe it's going to be Thursday. I'll, I'll send you the, the, the exact day and time. So, it, so housing was one that kept coming up um, often. Um, we did talk about equity and making sure that the resources are being invested in a way that is equitable here in the state of Rhode Island to make sure that our communities are left behind. That was very important part of the discussion that, that we heard um, with this first one. I was on a, um, a call earlier the week, in the week um, with some downtown um, arts and culture and um, city government officials talking about the reinvention of Kennedy Plaza and the next series of moves that could take place to uh, re-energize the plaza, particularly um, since there's been an exodus of, of people for over a year given the COVID situation. Then on that call, the whole topic of the stimulus came up and um, somebody mentioned, you know, well, you know, is there an opportunity to use some of these stimulus funds as one-time investment in the Superman building? Um, has anything like that surfaced? And what would be your initial reaction to something like that? Um, I'm not, I, have, I have not been part of any discussions um, like this, talking about the Superman building specifically. I think the question is, 
does the investment in the Superman building, if these resources will to go there, how this is going to benefit the whole state of Rhode Island? I think that's going to be the question that we're going to have. I think the Superman building is um, is a big part of, of, of Providence, a big part of Rhode Island. But um, the question is whether using these resources to put in the Superman building is going to generate is this is going to trans, translate into a generator of of jobs of um income how how I, I will have to see the plan that tells me how that investment will translate into uh an um a, a support for the whole state of Rhode Island. i don't i don't know that there was uh, it was just yeah, you're getting called, and it's. I'm uh, getting called. I'm, I'm trying not to get distracted by the phone calls, but the phone is ringing. <laughs> so we have one more, we have one more minute left. So yes. I, I did want to clarify that I'm not aware of any formal plan. Of yeah. As a possibility. So um, anyway, we are closing out. We have come to the end of our time together, and I thank you so much, Governor, for sharing time with us this afternoon. And before I let you go, is there anything in particular um, that you uh, would ask of us and how we might go forward together to help uh, support you and, and your agenda? I, I thank you so much for, for that question. I, I The first thing I want to ask of you and your membership and everyone watching is that this job, the job cannot be done alone. And the governor, me and the governor, we need to hear from you. You are the one that knows what it takes to run your business and what are the challenges that, that you're facing. You are the ones that are facing the challenges every day in our community. So please know that we really, truly want to hear from you and your ideas and um, in what do you think is the best way in which we can help you. So the our, my office uh, is available to assist in Please keep the information coming and, and, and don't assume that, that we already know what you need. Let us know, okay? Please just let us know what is it that you need us to prioritize. What are the areas that you feel we're not uh, paying enough attention? If, if we don't know, we cannot fix it. So please let us know. Very well said. And thank you very much for extending that um, opportunity to us. And we most definitely will follow up and uh, we say the same to you that we have an open door to you and to your administration and to the key administration on any matters that you feel uh, where we can help support the overall improvement of the Rhode Island economy. So thank you very much. Uh, we have been speaking with Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, uh, former president of the Providence City Council and now our Lieutenant Governor. So. Thank you again for taking the time and uh, we wish you a wonderful weekend and great success as you tour all of those 39 cities and towns within the first 100 days of your administration. So we're getting it done. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> See you well. Bye. Bye.